We are fortunate to have him with us tonight, so please help me in welcoming Mr. Matt Peterson. Thank you, Holly. Give it up for Holly. Talk about a leader. <clears throat> Uh, I've happened to have the good fortune to know Holly for a while, but uh, what uh, the time I was in the mayor's office, she was there as a Bonnet Fellow uh, while at UCLA and really provided critical leadership uh, in helping provide, present the foundation for really creating our sustainable city plan. So thank you for your commitment there and here at CSU Long Beach, Holly. So thank you for coming out tonight. Um, appreciate you spending some time with me. Hopefully it uh, really uh, shed some light on the challenges we face in the world. There's a lot of chaos out there, certainly in our country right now, politically, um, and some important questions being raised here. And I think whatever your concerns are for the future of your life, your kids' life to come, your future generations that walk not just here in Long Beach on this campus, but across California, across this nation, and across the world, you, you really need to think about how you and what you do to be part of the solution. Um, but before we're done, I am going to give you a discounted rate on the secret to saving the world. I think you came for free. Campus put a lot of resources into this, but for you, it would be a good deal. All right, first a bad joke. Two planets walk into the bar. One's really healthy, happy, the bounty of life just seems abundant. And the other planet's sick and haggard and brown and pockmarked, just <coughs> coughing. They both belly up to the bar. Bartender says, what'll be? The healthy planet orders a something, you know, like a cranberry juice. And the sick planet says, oh, the whiskey and the rocks. They're drinking, they eye each other, look each other over. Healthy planet says, now the sick plane is coughing, hacking up a lung, basically, and the healthy plane is like, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. I just got back from the doctor. Well, you seem sick. Should you be out in public? Well, <laughs> you'd need a drink if you just heard what I, I learned from the doctor. Well, 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 what is it? Backing off from the sick planet. Well, I think I got something real bad. You may, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Like, what, 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 what do you have? Measles? Oh, I got a case of the humans. Oh. <coughs> oh, don't you worry about that. I used to have a case of the humans, too. Look at me now. I got rid of them. Boom, boom. Shh. Terrible joke. But actually, my, one of my protégés, this guy named Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, used to tell that joke. And it was in Russian and translated into English, and he still got a hell of a lot more laughs than I ever did. But the point is, is that the planet's going to be fine without us. We cannot live on this planet and thrive and have a healthy economy and a good job and make decent wages and buy a home unless we've got a thriving planet, unless it's providing all those amazing things that the planet Earth provides to us. And one of the things that I discovered when I went to Africa seven years ago to the Eastern Congo, which this where this photo was taken, was that all of us benefit from natural resources from that part of the world. We get stuff from all over the world, right? It's like 25 truckloads of stuff that goes into one truckload of laptops. Um, but in this thing and in all of our electronics, there's something called rare earth minerals that are used to make it possible. Cobalt, tin, other rare earth minerals. And here in the Eastern Congo, and near this town near Bukavu, they mine rare earth minerals. And what do the militias there do to make sure they get their fair share of minerals? and to keep control of that feedstock so that they sell it to electronics companies. It's beginning to change, but they use violence. They rape women, destroy lives physically, mentally, emotionally, and it's horrific, un unspeakable atrocities in this part of the world. So we are connected to each other across this globe in ways that we can't even imagine. And you know what? When I was there to celebrate something called the opening of the City of Joy, in, uh, in this rare, this distant part of the world that very few people go to from the West, uh, these women were dancing and celebrating, even though their lives had been destroyed and taken away from them physically, emotionally, psychologically, financially, 
And they found joy and celebrated together and created community. And to me, it was humbling and also inspiring to say, what could I do? So, and just a small thing that I did when I went back, raised money to get them solar because they didn't have a reliable electric grid, came back a year later, delivered that solar with help of volunteers. We installed it. They now have a reliable electricity. And I came back and said to a state legislator, how can we reduce the amount of conflict minerals we're pulling from the earth? So we introduced legislation to try to get the state of California to, to pr pr only buy refurbished electronics. Unfortunately, that bill died due to lobbying in the electronics industry. But you, you always got to give your best effort, and you got to work in collaboration with other people. And it, to me, it's you know what I was left with more than anything is that these people loved their home, and they loved each other, and they celebrated with joy, and that to me was inspiring. So today I want to talk a little bit about you know, the future of high, higher education and sustainability is what can you do here on campus? What can you do as individual leaders on campus? This is in a rare moment in time. If you're able to, whether you're a part-time student, working full-time, going at night, or a full-time student, you, these are rare opportunities to be able to use the platform that the CSU system, in this case, the CSU Long Beach, or Go Beach, or I forget which one I'm supposed to say, Long Beach State, CSU Long Beach, but Go Beach, um, is really an opportunity for you to innovate, to experiment, to take some risks, and think about what you want to do as you go in forth into the world. Because whether you're a citizen entrepreneur, a city entrepreneur, a clean tech entrepreneur, you have an opportunity to innovate and really create the future together. We know what we're up against. I talked a little bit about it with my bad joke, but you know, overcrowding, drought, desertification around parts of the world, extreme fires. We're seeing the impacts of climate change uh, and just things like increased housing prices. I mean, it's insane, the cost of housing uh, here in the greater LA area and lots of urban areas. So what are we going to do? Um, well, we need to listen to the Earth. It's sending the signal. This is an SOS. It's literally people on an iceberg in Antarctica that had broken off from the ice shelf. A friend of mine was there, and he took this photo. And they were there to show, bear witness of what was happening with uh, the melting of the glaciers, uh, as well as the ice shelf in Antarctica, and send a signal to the world. And so, you know, the, the alarm's going off, and we keep eating snooze, you know, and uh, every 10 minutes, and we keep thinking we can put it off. But the time is now to act. And rather than get overwhelmed and, and go in denial or go out and party and forget about it, we need to have fun. Let's also get about the business of doing something. And this individual here, Bronte Velez, when I started Citizen E that Holly talked about, was somebody that inspired me. So at my 50th birthday party, I raised $25,000, and we decided to put that money to work and said, hey, who's got a crazy idea to make their community a better place? Keeps the environment in mind and other big picture issues in mind. And Bronte was one of 10 finalists that we did public voting and then we narrowed it down to, to her being the winner. And her idea was how do we, what if we took guns, melted them into shovels and planted trees on Dr. Martin Luther King's 50th anniversary of his assassination. In, and she did that in Atlanta. And so we gave her a $10,000 grant. And I mean, you could think of a lot of things that are worth doing with $10,000, but to me this inspired people. It, connected the dots with ecological crisis. She wanted to do this because she'd lost a friend to gun violence and to celebrate that person's life and everybody else in her community in Atlanta. And now she's working in Oakland and another community struggling with gun violence to remember those people's lives and reclaim those lives and then engage people in restoring the earth and connecting the dots and helping people heal from their losses and hopefully end the cycle of, of violence. So, you know, what, the way we design our solutions to challenges in society and is not just up to technology. We have to connect the dots to the bigger picture issues while putting focus on our own community because that's all we can really do is take responsibility for a corner of our world. Yes, we can go off to Congo and try to save the earth, but often where we need to start is with ourselves and in our own community. This is just some examples of some of the entrepreneurs uh, and, and that inspired me, and, um, and I won't be able to go through all their stories, but one of them was somebody, an activist in Puerto Rico, who was helping. We gave her $500, not a lot, but it, she was able to help, uh, I think, 50 farmers get seeds to, to help restart their farms after the 
uh, uh, after the crisis there, after the hurricane, uh, and lots of other great stories. Um, but I want to tell my story of how I ended up in New Orleans, which Holly mentioned briefly. So I watched, uh, maybe some of you may be too young, maybe you, were, you remember vaguely Hurricane Katrina, well, 13 years ago now. It was the worst hurricane, uh, uh, well, Hurricane Maria was pretty bad. And we've discovered that 3,000 plus people uh, lost their lives. In, in Hurricane uh, Katrina, uh, nearly 5,000 people lost their lives in different states um, across the Gulf Coast. In New Orleans, a lot of people suffered. I think there were nearly 2,000 people that lost their lives there. And we couldn't help, a nation of, as great as we are could not help the citizens of our own country escape after nearly a week of being uh, stuck. And we saw that again, and even though they're not a state, they're part of our country in Puerto Rico. But this to me was a wake-up call, not just because of climate change, because of we saw the failings of human engineering thinking we could outwit nature. nature owns the stadium and she always bats last. So we can't outwit mother nature. We can hold her off a little bit, we can work with her, but we also need to recognize, as you talked about earlier, about one of your competitions around resiliency and urban heat island effect, we need to really figure out how we work better with nature, not try to engineer against it. But that being said, New Orleans is a unique place in the world. It's a beautiful city. It's its own, really a city state. It's its own culture. Um, and of itself and a beautiful place that I wanted to do something to help rebuild, but to rebuild it differently. How do we rebuild to prepare for the next disaster? How did we rebuild homes that were gonna be disaster resistant, that could flood and still recover and not be con contaminated with mold, that could operate with solar power and be able to be lower energy bills? So we went about and put out an idea uh, to the world to say, hey, come with your solutions. We raised $25 million over the course of five years to help New Orleans rebuild differently. Leverage that and impacting 100, excuse me, $2 billion in school construction so that the schools were built to better standards. Um, brought in some well-known people. Anybody know who this guy is? Maybe the professors in the room? His name is Mikhail Gorbachev. He was the, the gentleman that was head of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. You've, maybe remember it from your history books, but Gorbachev was somebody who thought there was a different path forward. So he went to New Orleans and said, hey, if things aren't better, let's create our own revolution. I'll be back in five years. Um, but we put out this call for a design competition, and uh, the two young guys uh, in this photo were the winning uh, architects. The woman in the middle, Pam DeShiel, was from the neighborhood we focused on in the Lower Ninth Ward called Holy Cross. And there was this famous guy, you know, you may have heard of him, Brad Pitt, who was our jury chair. And uh, it was pretty amazing. You know, we helped raise awareness. We got uh, uh, homes built. This is uh, our first home in progress a, a year after the design competition. And we announced our big funding partner. Um, but you know who was the real hero? Now there's five homes. I don't think I put a picture in of the, of the completed homes, but there are five homes. People are living in them. Their energy bills are $24 a month. Uh, uh, and but the person that was the hero here was Pam. And there are more LEED certified, uh, more LEED Platinum certified homes in the Lower Ninth Ward than any other neighborhood in America. And that's because Pam had a crazy idea. After the storm, she got her neighborhood association to pass a resolution that they were gonna rebuild their neighborhood to be carbon neutral. Nobody at the time really knew what that meant and we're still figuring out what that means today. You may have heard those terms thrown about. But she set her neighborhood about to commit to that, to invite people to come, to innovate, to build differently. And it's that leadership by this individual who took responsibility for a corner of her world and connecting the dots that really is the true hero. Not me, not Brad Pitt, it's Pam DeShield. Sadly, Pam passed away a few years ago from a heart attack sitting at her desk and working hard to help her neighborhood. But we dedicated this visitor center we built in the Holy Cross neighborhood in the Lower Ninth Ward in her name. And that's the kind of leadership that people don't know their names, but they're the people that change the course of a community or a, or a nation even. And that's what we need to aspire to. Oh, we do have a photo. So uh, that's the Mississippi River behind us, uh, behind the homes, five homes. Uh, those, like I said, those homes have $24 bill month but energy bills, which in New Orleans average energy bills in the summer are $250, $350 a month. Uh, a remarked difference for the lower income families that live in these homes and a community center there to welcome the neighborhood. So, 
From New Orleans and running Global Green, I went to City Hall. I'd met a guy named Eric Garcetti. You may have heard of him, you may not have heard of him, but he's the mayor of Los Angeles. LA's four million people going on four and a half million people. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people in the city of LA. He's sort of the best known political figure in the region uh, because uh, the, you know, the, the mayor is representative of the region, but he's only in charge of the city of LA, but they have a lot of influence at the city. And for me, when I was asked by Eric Garcetti to be the first chief sustainability officer, I wasn't prepared to leave this great job and running Global Green, but he really convinced me it was an opportunity to not just help LA lead, but to help other cities lead across the nation. And we created the first annual, the first sustainable city plan that was a comprehensive look at everything in the city. You know, and when you think about sustainability, you usually think ah, that's a euphemism for the environment. It's sort of a, a way to talk about you know how we better pick up more trash and recycle more and use less energy and use less water well sustainability is really about three things it's about the environment yes climate change probably being the most critical pressing comprehensive cross-cutting challenge we face in our future and and right now uh, but it's also about the economy it's also about equity how do we make sure everybody's included in this opportunity no one's left behind. And that people who live in low-income housing projects are given opportunities to better their homes, to reduce those energy bills, to create better indoor air quality so that they don't have to send their loved ones to the hospital when they get a, an, emergen you know, an emergency with the asthma attack. Um, it's also about housing prices. So all these things work together, and that's why you need to think differently. You know, some of the best people I've had work for me over the years, and I've been blessed to have a lot of amazing people go to work for me and go off later and run organizations themselves and go to the White House and all sorts of amazing things. But some of the best people that I've ever had work for me were the critical thinkers who, and this is not me, I don't know how to play an instrument, but people that could play an instrument, that use other parts of their brain besides just logic. The heart and the soul are also important to help us solve these problems. They're also important ways to bring people together to collaborate. And that's really what we did when the mayor of LA asked me to be the chief sustainability officer. He is not a strong mayor. If you study local government, New York, Chicago, they have strong mayor systems for big cities, but not LA. He doesn't control the school system. He's got a strong city council. He's got a strong city attorney. He has to use persuasion as much as pounding your fist on the table. And that really means you've got to collaborate. How do you help everybody win? And that's what we really did when we started climate mayors. Uh, you know, at the time, Obama was in the White House. It was more about helping President Obama go to Paris, get a climate agreement in place, get the Chinese to sign on, and we were there to put wind at his back. We hosted a China summit with mayors from across China in Los Angeles. The representation of the mayors we had assembled showed the Chinese government, oh, okay, President Obama's serious. These cities are going to do it. And we know cities are where the action is. That's where the investments are made. That's where you know, buses are put on the road. That's where building standards are set. And they took it seriously. The climate deal got done. Things changed at the end of 2016, a year later. We had a different challenge. Somebody was going to the White House that we had no idea. Is he going to be pro-Paris? Is he going to be anti-science? We've seen it how it's played out, but at the time we said, let's put out an olive branch, let's offer, ask him to work with, uh, he who shall not be named, uh, to work with us. Didn't work with us. He pulled out of Paris, climate agreement. We were ready and we said that we, the mayors of, this, of great cities across this nation would come together and collaborate to commit to adopt the Paris climate agreement goals and implement them in their cities. Now, it, it, with the day that uh, uh, the president announced he was pulling out of Paris, we had 70 mayors sign on to that. A day later, we had 170. Now there's over 447 states across this great country who have said we're going to take action in our cities to help our citizens, to help future generations, and we're going to grow our economy. I mean, California's economy has grown record rates while it's led the world in climate leadership. We know we can do these things together. And these mayors are proving it across the country, not just here in this great state of ours, led by Governor Brown and Mayor Garcetti and Mayor Garcia here in Long Beach and others that have all committed to taking action. Whoop. So here you are at CSU Long Beach. Campuses like this are many cities. 
It is an opportunity to lead by example, to reduce operating costs, to inspire students, to give professors things to talk about in their classroom and draw upon as living lessons. And whether it's Beach 2030 or the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship or the campus sustainability commitments, you're leading by example. What other crazy ideas do you have? This 4.75 megawatt solar system in the foreground in front of the, the pyramid is a great example. Costs of solar going down. When I was advocating for solar 20 years ago, the cost per watt, this may not make sense to you, but it was $8. Now it's for the panels. Now it's below 60 cents a, kilo, a, a kilowatt hour, per, per watt, excuse me. Big, big difference. The efficiency of the panels went up from 8 to 20, on to 25%, but the real disruption was in price. Uh, and now we're seeing solar overtake natural gas. Yeah, it's intermittent, so we need battery storage, we need other things to level that use out, uh, but the more uh, we get solar, we, the more we can use the power of the sun, the more we use wind, other renewable energy resources, that's better for the environment. That's a solution to climate change. Now we need to plug in vehicles. We need to get more electric cars on the road. You have Port of Long Beach behind, you know, near, near here, Port of LA too, the largest port complex in, in total in the world, in the Western Hemisphere. 40% of all the goods move through the ports of LA and Long Beach. Also the biggest source of air pollution in Southern California, those diesel trucks. It's a strong part of our economy. Lots of people employed driving those trucks. Tough job. Not a great way to make a living, but they love it. If they, I mean, they, if they're making a living, they love it. Uh, and if, if it gets hard, it, if fuel prices go back up, it makes it harder. So we know that electricity is a lot cheaper in electric vehicles than, than diesel and gas. So we're working, my organization is working with the industry to see how do we get new innovations in place so that we can r drive down the cost of electric trucks, extend the range, put in the infrastructure needed to do that. You here at Long Beach have an opportunity to influence that future. Think about the ways you can, you can create innovation, whether it's in industry, in student life, in the fields you're studying, because that's the real opportunity here to lead. Uh, and you have this opportunity to, to use this model of Long Beach uh, and really do your own thing. So I was a CSU student, as Holly said. I was a student leader. I was the president of a, of a fraternity. Uh, and every step of the way, I was trying to do things differently. It wasn't easy, uh, but we did little things along the way. One, one thing we did was a new, what we called the new commute. We were trying to promote different forms of transportation. I had a county supervisor race the Chamber of Commerce CEO. Uh, she, the supervisor was on a bike. He was in an SUV. She won because she got through traffic quicker through the downtown of Chico. Um, we planted after the uh, Tiananmen Square massacre. Not everybody remembered that, but it was an important moment in history uh, as people rose up in China to speak for freedom and democracy. We organized the Chinese students that were on campus to plant a tree of democracy. You can do things here and now. Do not wait for tomorrow. Find the opportunity. Get your crazy idea together. Rally people around you. Find a way to gather attention. It doesn't have to be a celebrity. It can be, it can be something that just creates a bit of inspiration. Create that object of aspiration, whether it's collaboration, fun, innovation, and draw people around your idea. Um, not everybody needs to be the hero or the leader. We see uh, the importance of collaboration right now, bringing everybody along. You know, Elon Musk, who is one of the most brilliant people that walks the face of this earth, has a force of will, like any other, is changing the future course of, you know, of humanity with his work with SpaceX and with Tesla. Uh, he also knows now, well, people have tried to show him, that he needs a team around him to, to deliver on these goals. And he can't just say whatever he wants. You know, so what we say matters. And we know what we do matters. And we know that right now more than ever with the hearings going on in Washington, uh, that our actions do matter. How we treat each other matters. How we speak to each other. How we respect each other matters. Uh, and those are the things that lead to great collaboration, uh, along with ideas and solutions. And we all got to be in. You know, this is an all-hands-on-deck time uh, to really begin to tackle the problems we have. This is your mayor and your president of the university. Now, this is exciting. Your net zero. How many people know you have your the first net zero building on, in the CSU systems here at Long Beach? How many people know that? I learned that yesterday, thanks to Holly. So this, this campus is leading the way. Your university president signed on to the climate commitment, along with many other university presidents across the country. 
take advantage of this platform and opportunity to lead. So I want to talk a little bit about my current job and talk about another way you can be an entrepreneur, whether it's here on campus as a citizen entrepreneur, as you think about your future, maybe you're going to local government, there's a great, you know, great programs here for public administration uh, that you can look into and help change the world that way. Uh, but I run this great place called the LA Clean Tech Incubator. And uh, I think we have a video here. Since 2011, Lacey's been focused on helping clean tech startups and growing the green economy. For the last two decades, I've been working with citizens and cities to fight climate change. Now I've turned my attention to helping companies. Our three priorities are advancing zero emissions transportation, clean energy, and smart city solutions. We want to inspire you to come up with the next big idea to fight climate change. We're making new ways to light up LA. We give people a smarter way to commute. We make tableware that's good for people and good for the planet. We're transforming air travel by building quiet, zero emission planes. Our indoor farms provide access to fresh, healthy food for communities around the world. We want to reduce America's dependence on foreign oil and create a world powered by renewable energy. LACI will continue the work it's known for, supporting clean tech startups and helping them commercialize their technologies. Measuring our company's efforts on climate action and helping maximize their impact but we can do more. The core DNA of Lacey isn't just about creating clean tech startups. We're building an inclusive green economy by unlocking innovation through incubation, transforming markets, and enhancing community. We're building relationships with industry leaders in key technology sectors. Developing pilot projects in mobility and clean energy. We'll engage the innovative spirit of LA's creative community. We'll provide the spark for future entrepreneurs and the leadership LA will need when facing the challenges of the future. Building a future that belongs to all of us. And create a clean tech ecosystem that looks like the people of LA. Simply put, we can't do this without you. Whether you bring your financial support, your knowledge and networks, or just bring yourself, you belong here. Join this adventure. This energy. This community. We're building an inclusive green economy for the people of Los Angeles. And if we can make it happen here, we can make it happen everywhere. Join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your support. So that's a little promotional video of the organization. But the guy, the person I wanted to point out who, um, for you students here, is uh, the guy that was talking about foreign oil. His name is Max Aram. He was a political refugee from Iran. And he escaped his country. Uh, found refuge here in the United States, thanks to friends and family, and was a CSU Northridge student when he came up with this idea to create the startup called Pick My Solar. How do we help make it easier for people to buy solar, put it on their rooftops, and reduce dependency on foreign oil and dirty energy? So no idea is too big or too small. It's really about how you focus your energy and rally people around your idea. These are some of the startups in our portfolio, ranging across transportation, energy, smart and sustainable cities, and a number of different um, areas. And you know, so think about what your big idea is, whether you want to just do something here while on campus, whether it's just mobilizing people towards a social or an environmental action. Uh, how do you help your larger community, the campus, and the city you work and live in or, and study in, or the future business you want to start? I mean, now is the time. You know, let your freedom reign, roam free and think about what you can do to be part of this future. Um, just a quick note on the campus, if you ever want to come down for a visit, we have Fridays at noon, we have a public tour. It's an amazing 61,000 square foot facility, really the, the model of public-private partnership. It, the, city, the city of LA actually owns this building. It's uh, through the Department of Water and Power, our municipal utility, the, th the largest municipal utility in the country. And it's a beautiful, really um, inspiring space. You walk in, you're, you're really just excited by the energy in there, not just because of the entrepreneurs. There's great nonprofits like Ciclavia and River LA that call it home and others, as well as the entrepreneurs. And there's events there all the time. Please come, uh, be there, 
and even apply to be a portfolio company with your idea once you get it together. There's resources on there to help guide you and think about how you could create a clean tech startup and work with your incubator here on campus to form your ideas and work with your, the, 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 the Climathon and other ways to think about your solutions. You have the resources and the platform here at CSU Long Beach to do that. Um, talked about this in the video. One other thing that we're working on is this transportation electrification partnership. Transportation is our biggest challenge in California to t tackle climate change. We're leading on clean energy. The st California State Senator Kevin DeLeon just got his bill passed, SB 100, which is going to get California to 100% clean energy by 2045. That's going to be 80% renewable energy. The rest will have to be zero emissions, carbon-free electricity. So the big challenge ahead of us is transportation. We talked about the ports and goods movement and trucks, but the biggest portion are those passenger vehicles many of us drive. Uh, yes, we can get out of our car tomorrow. I think uh, tomorrow is, uh, is, is, what is it, clean air day in LA in the region, so get out of your car, walk, bike if you can, uh, ride the bus, whatever it is. I drive an electric car. Um, there are a lot of things that we can do in basic ways to both improve our health as well as help the environment. But this is representative of, of really important leadership in LA, heads of utilities, the head of the Air Resources Board, which is the top regulator, and they've all come together. It doesn't sound exciting. Hey, more people working together, a photo, oh, who cares? Um, well, they're actually working to set a goal to help increase uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by the time the world arrives here for the Olympics in 2028. We're gonna have athletes from around the world, we're gonna have visitors from around the world, it's our time to put California and LA's leadership front and center and clean that air. We've had a record number of bad air days here in Southern California. If you haven't noticed, it's been pretty bad and it's getting worse every year again. We've come a long way since the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even the 80s with air quality here, but we've got a long way to go and it's getting worse, partially because we have a good economy. We've got to clean up the trucks and the cars on the road, um, but that's what the spirit of collaboration can do and over the next few years, I think we'll make a lot of great progress. Um, I'm not gonna make you look at this. This is really, you can go online and look at it at our website, lacia.org, uh, but that shows you the goals we've set and the things we're focused on to try to move the needle. Um, how many people have been in an electric car? About half. Uh, what, what do you notice that's different about being in an electric car? Quiet. Quiet. Anybody been in an electric bus? couple people. Really much quieter than certainly a diesel bus, but really a lot quieter than a natural gas bus. Think about it in those neighborhoods. So it also has a quality of life impact, uh, and I think it'll change people's relationship to riding a bus. Metro is going to get to all uh, electric buses by 2030, and other transit agencies are too. Uh, but in this plan, they've committed to get, try to get there by 2028, a couple years ahead of schedule. Um, this is some of my colleagues and team at, at the organization I work with, along with volunteers in the community, really working hard to try to create the future that they want to create. Um, but I, I want to leave you, I promised you the discounted rate on the secret to saving the world. So here it is. Everybody stand up. You've saved the world, you stood up, that's good. No, just kidding. All right, raise your right hand. Repeat after me. There's been an exciting announcement recently. I think that you'll get the inspiration here. Let's go Lakers. Oh, sorry. All right, I was a little excited about LeBron coming. Um, think about what I talked about during my talk, what I talked about, what I noticed when I was in the Congo. Now repeat after me. I love my home. Now do me a favor, give the person next to you a big hug, or if you're more comfortable, a handshake or a high five. But that's how trust and success is created, is human contact. This is how we're gonna build the future we want. Because if we love our home, and we care and respect each other, and connect with each other as neighbors, as community members, that's how we're going to move forward, because we can't do this in isolation. We can't do this on our own. We have to work together. So what's your big idea? What are you going to do? Come talk to me about it in a year. I want to hear what exciting things you're going to do. So thank you for having me very much.
You know, so I think the things that I've seen that you could think about for your class uh, and, and supply chain management is certainly uh, in, as you're preparing people to go and think about how they procure goods and services for large organizations is, you know, you can put in purchasing preferences and that's really helpful. And there are a lot of things that cities are layering on and, and so then and if so many priorities, nothing becomes a priority. So how do you find not singular, but comprehensive frameworks to apply um, and ways to, to really understand the chain of custody and, and use third party certifications as much as you can, because you can't do it all, but you need to trust, but verify, and also think about how, how, do, you, how do you verify from time to time? Are they really doing what they're saying they're doing? Um, we often take people at face value on their claims, and sometimes we just need to check if we have the ability to. Um, so, you know, the city of LA just hired a chief procurement officer. So also part of the challenge is if you've got disaggregated procurement, there's autonomy and, you know, authority that's given, but you also lose some control. And you also leverage, you lose the leverage of a bigger market um, to be able to demand more, incre you know, increased recycled content and paper or, uh, or how to um, um, get electric vehicles, for example. So uh, one, a couple ideas just to share besides looking at what the chief procurement officer is doing in the city of LA, is the mayor of LA just to launch this procurement platform uh, for small cities to buy electric vehicles. So if you're in a small city, or you're in a state that is not one of the 11 or 12 states that has a, real, a lot of electric vehicles being sold in your state, you may have a tough time just getting an electric vehicle for your city period let alone getting a good price. So this platform is gonna allow cities across the country to pool their buying power uh, and get a better price on a Chevy Bolt for a city employee or whatever the vehicle might be. So that's something to look at and see uh, how that's working in a similar sort of vein, the city of LA's police department procured 250 BMW i3s and they were able to not only get a great price, they were able to get technology access that other automakers weren't willing to provide because they asked for it. So they were able to get telematics access. So as we think about the future of autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles, something I'm sure some of the students and some of the professors are thinking about how that changes our future, beginning to understand how we get access and what we do with that data. That's another thing to think about. What access to data can you get from the services you provide as well as the, the platforms you provide? Here on campus, there's infrastructure. How could you look at, you know, as you put in Internet of Things device, the IoT devices and other ways uh, to, to access uh, information, what do you do with that data? What, what kind of um, APIs can you program on top of it? So there's other ways to think about procurement than other than just I'm buying a piece of paper. Um, certainly what is in that paper um, or what kind of data we could get and use from uh, whatever services we're procuring or how do we use our infrastructure to get more uh, benefit to whoever we're, we're working with, whatever our population is. We're going to be doing, a, 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 we have an advanced prototyping center that has $11 million worth of equipment. So here on campus, I'm sure you have a wet lab somewhere, somewhere there's a chemistry lab or a biochemistry lab. We have one there that's available to the public. You have to pass a little screening test for security because we have hazardous chemicals in there, but um, it's a minimal fee. But we're also going to, uh, we have an electronics lab, we have a water jet, we have CNC machinery. Rare to find publicly available, sort of it's a maker space on steroids or an industrial prototyping center. So we're going to do a prototyping uh, fellowship. And so if you're interested, you can apply. Uh, we're targeting CSU and, and community college students. Uh, that, uh, I think the program will open up for applications later this year. So it's another way to sort of get your hands dirty and think about how you create a product or a tool to help uh, solve the challenges you're concerned about or just learn some new skills. Um, as you, you go through your studies. So there's different ways to, to engage. The other way is if you've got a crazy idea for business, go on the website, see some of the resources to help guide you in shaping your idea. Again, turn to your resources here on campus as well. Uh, and when you're ready, apply to be a, a portfolio company and, and just going through that process could help you a lot. Inclusive is a very intentional world, word that we've chosen. So green economy kind of evokes what broadly we're talking about in terms of solving climate change, you know, using less water, restoring ecosystems, um, reducing waste and using that waste in better ways once it's created. But being inclusive means, you know, tech, uh, the tech industry 
looks a lot like me, although 20, 25 years younger. Um, and, uh, and so how do we get more people that represent our community that are starting these companies? Um, we've made a real tension at, at our organization um, to recruit founders uh, uh, from underrepresented communities, women and people of color. Um, who have a tougher time getting access to capital, although we know companies that have women and uh, people of color in the C-suite, the executives, they perform better, uh, yet they have a tough time, tougher time getting investment. So we're looking at ways that we can both not just recruit them, but help get them access to capital. Um, the other way is through the workforce. Uh, so how do we include more people, uh, get more girls and women into thinking about engineering careers? Um, that's one strategy, so we've been doing some cohorts of, of workforce development to see how we inspire uh, young women um, in middle school and high school, uh, as well as training uh, community college students uh, to at least uh, on the equipment we talked about, sort of getting them thinking about why an engineering degree would be, be useful. Um, and then, uh, you know, other sort of all broader STEAM uh, initiatives that we're, we're doing in partnership with other organizations. Uh, and then tracking and measure, measuring and tracking uh, the progress we're making with our startups in terms of diversity, again, of the workforce and in the C-suite. Um, and then we're going to go out into the community and do proactive recruitment for small business owners and founders throughout Los Angeles who, uh, who again, may not be all focused on clean tech, but they may be focused on some element of impact in their community. So they're delivering a business that's providing uh, a service that's going to help reduce obesity or uh, in, in find ways to help women, uh, small in business founders, whatever it is. It could be, you know, we don't know what it's going to be. We don't come in with a prescription of what it's going to be. So there's a number of things that we're trying to do, but most important is, is to measure, set goals, measure the impact, track it, and then continue to iterate and then adapt at how we're doing. Um, we're far from figuring it out, but we're trying a lot of different things to see what works to help empower and support entrepreneurs. Uh, again, that don't look like what we normally think of when we think of Silicon Valley for sure or Silicon Beach, um, but try to inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs. Uh, Los Angeles just implemented um, something called the commercial franchise. Uh, so for businesses and multifamily, like apartment buildings, they have a new system of trash pickup. Um, and the idea is before commercial waste haulers who serve those customers, restaurants, you know, office buildings, apartment buildings, they didn't have to provide recycling. There was no city requirement. Now with, they've created zones that uh, initially had some hiccups for sure that when they rolled it out, problems in service, some cost problems, now it's sort of leveling out. Now every building has to have some ability to recycle. So if you lived in an individual home, you'd always have the opportunity to, to recycle in, in your separate bins. Um, so now we're seeing more comprehensive recycling. And food waste or you know compost, which you're, you also asked about, is a critical issue. So um, the city of LA is unique for a big city in that it has a separate sewage system from its, its um, uh, stormwater system. So usually those are combined, particularly in older cities. Uh, and, and so what that does is it creates an opportunity for the city of LA to think about, is it better to put a lot of trucks on the road picking up food waste and compost, um, or should we send it through our sewage system and get it bat down at Hyperion, uh, and then find useful uses for, for it there. Um, the downside to that too, so there's always trade, you know, trade-offs. Um, but for these larger businesses, restaurants, apartment buildings where you have more concentrated food waste and compost, or uh, it's an opportunity to gather that and it's higher quality usually than the residential stream. Uh, uh, and so now, right now we're sending it up to Bakersfield, Kern County, and then it's uh, used for farms after it's composted. And now the city is really looking at how do they keep that here because all the diesel emissions and gas used to truck that stuff up to Kern County is not inconsequential. Um, so the city's looking at more local solutions uh, to deal with the waste. Uh, some, some of it goes to, uh, some of the trash goes to the surf plant that the city of Long Beach owns and cooperates with the city of LA. It's one of the few remaining incinerators. It's a becoming next generation. Um, uh, it's becoming cleaner. Trash energy is, leads to potential toxins in the environment, so that has a downside too. Um, but those are the different ways the city's thinking about it. 
Great question. So we have a South Coast Air Quality Management District. They're headquartered in Diamond Bar, um, a place not many people may have necessarily have been, but they're really important. Now, they get their authority to regulate the air from the State Air Resources Board. The state of California has more aggressive laws on clean air and greenhouse gas emissions as a pollutant, clean air as an air pollutant, than the federal government because we implemented a law for clean air before the federal government does. Now, EPA, thanks to the guy in the White House, is trying to take that right away for, for California to continue that tradition and history of leadership. But that aside, the authority to regulate air comes from generally their EPA to the Air Resources Board and then to the Air Quality Management District. So that entity has to submit a clean air action plan or air quality management plan to the state and the State Air Resources Board can either accept it, deny it, or comment and push part of it back. Um, recently, there was a change in um, the composition of the board, the AQMD, about a year and a half, two years ago. <clears throat> and uh, you know, some people might be happy about it, some people are not. Um, but long story short, because air quality challenges in Southern California are, are creating urgency around reducing smog-forming pollutants, there is a bit of a tension at the Air Quality Management District on um, mobile sources, which is really boils down to as we convert from diesel trucks, do we transition to natural gas trucks, or do we now leapfrog to all zero emission vehicles? So what we've seen in the last year is that big companies like Daimler that makes Freightliner trucks, the biggest manufacturer of trucks, Volvo, third largest manufacturer of trucks, they're coming out with all electric solutions. They're not gonna do natural gas. They're not gonna do hydrogen fuel cell, which is mostly that source is coming from reformation of natural gas. So you could say to your representatives, uh, uh, the city of LA, Joe Biscaino, who represents San Pedro and Wilmington, not far from here, is the, is the city of LA's representative on that board. Uh, I th I'm trying to remember who represents uh, south, uh, the South uh, Beach, uh, South Coast cities here. Um, but you can find out who that representative is. I not remember, I don't think it's Mayor Garcia, but it might be. And uh, uh, he now represents, he's, a, he's got a seat in the Metro Board, so that's also of regional importance. Uh, and express the need to, to move to zero emissions um, uh, uh, sooner and faster. Um, we know that that's critical for climate change and air quality, and the solutions are increasingly uh, being available in terms of the products. Um, the other sources they regulate primarily are, are stationary, so the refineries and industrial sources. Um, and they just changed the rule. They had kind of a, a, a rule that was allowing a lot of gaming of the system, and they've closed a big part of that loophole, thankfully. So they deserve some credit uh, because the oil industry was not happy about that. Um, but it's critical, with particularly down here with all the refineries, you know well that we get a lot of bad air from, from those sources as well. The jobs that I have now did not exist uh, when I was in college. Um, and in some cases I created or went into an organization, created my own job. The mayor created a job, had me fill it for the first time. Um, so, you know, it wasn't like I went out and defined everything entirely on my own. But um, you do have to make things work and you have to work within the system and figure out how to use the resources and as the importance of sustainability is not just seen as like a facilities thing or uh, a feel good community for corporations as corporate social responsibility that we see these things and how they work together and they've elevated in importance in organizations and cities and companies. Um, that's where the jobs of the future I think are going to come in this space uh, and that means you're going to have to have uh, more experience uh, um, and, and more creativity and, and more ability to both lead and, and, and collaborate. Um, and that's why what you do here is going to make such a difference in your future career. Now, the other thing that's happening is, you know, if we have autonomous vehicles coming, uh, we need to make sure they're electric and they're shared so we don't just end up with more vehicles on the road. Uh, but that also means that there's going to be an impact on, okay, the gig economy. It is what it is. It's great if it works for you and you can make some money but it doesn't necessarily replace the kind of careers that we, we see that, that are being disrupted. So there's uncertainty, uh, but I think we can help define um, how to address some of that uncertainty and create the future as we think about what those jobs are gonna be. 
So if you haven't seen the bird scooters, the lime scooters, now the lift scooters, now the jump scooters, and now any other number of scooters, they're coming to a street near you. Um, and they're fun. Uh, they also can be dangerous. And so we need to take all these things into consideration. But the thing from a traffic standpoint, which, you know, because there's zero emissions, uh, the opportunity is how do we get people out of their cars for those trips of two miles or less? And that's really what they're addressing. They're, where they're eroding Lyft and, and Uber's uh, share of the market and, and ridership is those shorter trips, which is exactly what we, you know, we never, you know, when I was in the city, we were trying to figure out how to reduce those trips. We never imagined a, a, an electric scooter being the solution. We thought dock-based bike share would be the solution. Now that's old school. Now that's antiquated technology. That was just put in place two, three years ago. Um, now we see these dockless electric scooters and bikes, but I think the scooters are going to prevail over the electric bikes because they're easier to charge. Um, so we have two startups in our portfolio, one called Perch and one called Clever. Perch is trying to figure out better ways to charge those scooters and to create some sanity around racking and rather than see them stacked up or thrown strewn about, helping cities figure out how to better manage them. Clever has got a, uh, they can't talk about everything they're doing because they're sort of in stealth mode, but they're figuring out better ways to help use geolocation, uh, GPS for, for, for geofencing for narrower, smaller spaces to, to get those vehicles parked where they should be uh, rather than strewn about. Um, and uh, other innovations uh, that they're talking to different uh, scooter companies. But I think that last mile, first mile solution is a great opportunity. And we'll be doing, with the city of Long Beach, my organization's partnering with, thanks to the Knight Foundation, figure out how long, I think it's Alameda, um, <laughs> trying to remember the street name right now, but, but where the city's done some innovation already around thinking about mobility solutions. So we're gonna, we're gonna see whether it's with our startups or others, how do we help do some community-based sourcing of ideas, but also then encouraging of zero emission solutions for that last mile, first mile uh, piece of the equation. So it's exciting, but you know, great upside, but also if, if you know, the downside is safety and, and littering the sidewalks and getting over proliferation and, and of course, you know, it's always better to walk uh, or ride your bike, get a little physical exercise, but it's great for those, those solutions where you need to, to go a little further. So for passenger vehicles, the Japanese automakers, particularly Honda and, and Toyota, really put a focus on fuel cells um, and really tried to get momentum around, and there's still an effort underway to get fueling stations in place. So. Um, you talked about the sourcing of hydrogen. Um, now, the actual infrastructure to fuel uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, it's not there yet. And the thing about electricity is that it's everywhere. So you can charge, if you have, a, you know, if you have access to a charger at your home, you can just plug it in at night and charge your car overnight. There's, uh, you know, chargers will be more and more ubiquitous. So that's really the differential. Uh, on the source of the hydrogen, so right now, primarily, yes, the ideal solution would be electrolysis. How do you can combine electricity and water to create hydrogen? Most of it's being created through natural gas and peeling off molecules to create hydrogen. That's still carbon-based economy. Uh, it's cleaner because you're still the, there's no tailpipe emissions. Um, uh, but that's uh, that's a, you know just an extra step. I think. For hydrogen fuel cells, there's probably more promise in the heavy duty sector than there is in the light duty sector, passenger cars. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, but that's, it's, it's the, really the infrastructure challenge that's the biggest impediment to hydrogen, you know, the reformation issue aside. Great question. So when uh, I first got to the mayor's office, all the trash truck drivers used to get these Thomas Guide maps. Anybody ever seen a Thomas Guide map? There's a few of us. My son was a huge fan of maps, and so one Christmas he asked me to buy him a Thomas Guide map uh, book. And uh, that's back how we used to navigate LA. It was like page G28, you know, section four, t I, you know, I don't even remember how it worked. But now we use our phones. So what the city did, one of the employees had this crazy idea, hey, if we had smart devices we could get our route map in a different way than getting a copy of a Thomas Guide map with our route for that day highlighted. I mean, think about it. And the, like three years ago, we were sending out our trash truck drivers around the city, so every morning they had to dispatch that way. Now, they're able to save fuel, 
cost, time, fewer emissions by using a smart device to be able to get their route every day. And it just has changed so much. But that was a, an innovation from an employee of the sanitation department. And the city embraced it. They got a small grant internally. There was a competition for ideas. Another one just uh, that inspired this, what we called the red button ideas. There was a maintenance staff person at a, at a rec recreation facility at the parks department. And uh, there was this gym that the lights, you, could eat, you, know, you couldn't turn them off because it would, uh, I don't remember what kind of light system, you just couldn't turn them off. And uh, so and rather than figuring out it would cost like $50,000 to rewire a timer, I, it was some thing and nobody was gonna spend the money. He just went out to Home Depot, bought a junction box and a red button and so when you wanted to turn it off, you press the button. If you wanted to turn it on, you press the button. And so it would stay on for a certain amount of time. It had a, like a fixed time, like two hours, so it wouldn't stay on all night. But then the mayor created these red buttons, uh, red button competition for internal ideas. So sometimes the simplest ideas come from people who aren't at the top. They're often in the workforce. And so that's a, both a, an example of inspiration, hopefully for innovation, as well as answer to your question. Great question. So, uh, Lacey's, the Citizen E program is something I've done myself. If you want to volunteer to help me, I could use some help because I got to get the next search for Citizen E started. Uh, but you can apply on citizene.org. Um, and my goal is to raise money to do the next search by the beginning of the year, uh, 2019. Uh, for Lacey, you can apply to be a volunteer, an intern. Uh, we call it volunteer because um, they're unpaid uh, internships right now. Um, we do have some limited uh, paid internships. You can do that, or you can apply to be, you know, portfolio company if you have a business idea that's sort of shaped. Uh, but those are the three suggestions I have. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I want to hear your crazy idea <laughs> later. Then please, um, b before you, I have more announcements before you leave. But let's all thank Mr. Peterson with another round of applause. Thank you.